The second reading today comes from Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven, and the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it, and the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald and circled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being." Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are given this amazing vision. Lord, thank you for the message that we, are, uh, that we hear through it. And Lord, may you uh, open our hearts so that we might be willing to receive what you have for us today. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing and acceptable to you, God, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I don't want to take it for granted that this has been a very trying time. It's been so discombobulating. For many of us, we feel very isolated. We're lonely. For many other, uh, others of us, we are in that struggle. We're fighting to remain faithful, to have faith over fear. And for others of us, uh, maybe it's been not that bad. Maybe it's been a little bit easier, and yet there are these moments where we find ourselves perhaps a little bit anxious, perhaps a little bit fearful. You know, what's going on with our loved ones? What are we going to do with our children this fall? There are all these questions, and it's hard to answer, and we don't know what's happening. And we don't know why it's happening. With so many feelings that are so very uncertain, what, are, what is the follower of Jesus Christ to do? What are we called to do in this very moment? Now, as many psalms do, the psalmists were calling out to God and they would call out to God an honest prayer and they would say things like, God, don't you see that I'm being trodden? Don't you see that my enemies surround me? Don't you see that there are these terrible things happening to me? Vindicate me. See me. Take care of me. You are my refuge. And they make that pivot. They make that turn to then say, but you, God, are the one who saves. You are the one who is holy. You are the one who loves us and who takes care of us. And they make that pivot to turn to and refocus their attention on the Lord God who is. And we see that in the, with the Apostle John too in his revelation that he does the same thing as these visions were revealed to him. In the early chapters we see where John was, that he was in exile. He was on the island of Patmos. And while he's on the island of Patmos, uh, he has these amazing visions. And the, the initial visions in chapters 1 to 3 are of the seven churches, these seven major churches in the area. And he has a specific message from the Lord Jesus to them about how they are doing, about how he wants to encourage them to keep going, and how for some of them he's exhorting them, and for some others of them he's correcting them. And he's like, hey, you got to shape up in this time. 
but he encourages them and he says, hey, look, there is more persecution because of what you believe, because you believe in me, there are going to be even more hardships coming and you need to know that, but keep going. And then all of a sudden, after those, uh, those three chapters, John comes back to himself, but then revealed to him is another vision. At the end of uh, chapter 3, he has this vision of the church of Laodicea, and you know Jesus is standing outside their church door, and he's knocking. He says, I stand at the door and knock. And then in the early part of chapter 4, and we actually had this really wonderfully told to us, uh, preached to us by a guest speaker, Angelica Atkins, uh, a few months ago, where the door is now open and John is being invited to come in. And now we get to refocus on the God who is in control. God is on his throne. John is taken up by the Spirit and he sees this vision and he is made aware of these amazing things in God's throne room. And as John sees this, he can only try to explain what he's seeing, but his, like, there's only so much that the finite human mind can describe. And so he's saying, these things are, are like this. And he's trying to find the words, and he's saying, okay, so here I am. I was in the heavenlies, and I saw God's throne room, and I saw the throne, and I saw God sitting on the throne. He said, this is what it's like. The throne was amazing. Here's this appearance of this jasper and ruby. Here is this amazing crystals that are of great worth. Jasper stone was this translucent type of stone that was very precious. And, and ruby, other, the, another translation calls it sardius. It's this blood red stone. And it's this amazing thing. And, and then John says, you know, even around the throne, encircling it, there is something, it's like emerald, but it's also like a rainbow. He's, he's grasping for words to describe what he's seeing. It's like a rainbow. And what that reminds us of is the sign of the covenant that God had made with Noah that he would no longer destroy the earth and that he takes his bow, his, his weapon of divine, uh, his divine instrument of judgment and he hangs it in the sky. And he takes that bow and he hangs it in the sky and that rainbow is there. God is a covenant-keeping God. And around that throne is a rainbow that reminds us that God is a covenant-keeping God. And he sees who is around the throne as well. And circled around him are these other 24 thrones. And on those 24 thrones are these 24 elders. And they're clothed in dazzling white with golden crowns on their heads. And what they were wearing, it comes from the imagery that that John had used as he was writing to those seven churches in the first three chapters. He says that they were wearing white, a kind of white that no launderer could ever make. You know, we see this kind of reminds us, it, it not kind of, it reminds us exactly of what happened when Jesus was transfigured before them. He was clothed in this brilliant white that no launderer could ever make like that. And he is shining. He's transformed in their presence and it, it signifies Jesus' holiness and his purity. And that's what these 24 elders had on. And if we look back to the church of Sardis and the church of the Laodiceans in Revelation chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, it's up here on the slide. You have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They've remained pure. They will walk with me. They're dressed in white. And look at the church of Laodicea. You know, the church of Sardis was doing better, we can read there, that there are those who have not soiled their clothes. But then we have the church of Laodicea, where Jesus is telling the Laodiceans who are very rich and very, very comfortable, and he's saying, look, you think you're okay because you're so wealthy, but actually, I have news for you. And he warns them. And now he's telling them, use that gold instead for something more meaningful. 
to buy white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness. He's telling them, spend your things on what's worthwhile. He's saying, look, here's these white clothing. And, and so John is referencing back to those things. It symbolized purity, faithfulness, those who followed Christ Jesus in faithfulness, like those in Sardis. But then we also see here that the elders are wearing crowns. And again, the crowns are mentioned as Jesus addressed the church in Smyrna in chapter 2, verse 10. And the church of Philadelphia in chapter 3, verse 11. And James also wrote about this very imagery in his letter in James chapter 1, verse 12. Let's see here. Do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. He's letting them in that they're going to go through some persecution. You're going to go through this persecution. Be faithful even to the point of death. I will give you life as your victor's crown. And then to the church in Philadelphia, he said, I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. So here you have this crown. Don't let anyone take it. Remain faithful. James writes about it. Blessed is the one who perseveres. Then that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. These elders, they're the ones who are pure. They're the ones who are faithful. These are the ones who have these crowns of life, who have persevered and will persevere. It's not specified who these elders are, but they may actually reflect the 24 divisions of the Levites who had different roles in the temple and in worship. And we don't have it on a slide, but if you wanted to check it out, it's in 1 Chronicles chapter 24, verse 4, where we see this breakdown of the different worship leaders from the Levites. And perhaps these were also angelic beings who were these elders who led in worship, but that were wearing this white that had these crowns, that John is, is saying this is what's happening in the throne room of God even though there's this persecution that's going to happen and these terrible things that are going to happen to the church, here's what's happening in the throne room, this glory, this throne that is unapproachable because of the blinding light of all these crystal-like images that he's seeing. Here are these 24 elders that are surrounding God's throne. And from God's throne itself, from God himself, there's flashes of the lightning, there are peals of thunder, there are these displays of power, and that is the one who is sitting on the throne, the one who is powerful, the one who is almighty. And before that throne are these seven lamps. And these seven lamps of the throne represent the fullness of the Spirit of God. And you're, maybe you're wondering, how do, you, how do you know that? Because the seven lamps, you know, the number seven is actually a, a special number in Scripture. Not that we want to read into all of Scripture like this and make numbers work for us, but the number seven, if you look through, through Scripture, you see that it is a holy number. It's a full number. It's, co it's complete. And so you have these seven lamps. You have the seven lamps that represent the fullness of the Spirit of God this also echoes from Zechariah's prophecy in chapter 4, verse 2 that we see here. He asked Zechariah, what do you see? And he answered, I see a solid gold lampstand with bowls at the top, and there's seven lamps attached to it with seven channels to the lamp. So it had this one body of the main lamp and these seven branches coming from it. Perhaps it looked like that, but it symbolizes the Spirit. And so before God the Father is the fullness of the Spirit before him. And John is the one who's also brought up in the power of the Spirit. And John is also the one who hears the voice of the Son calling to him like a trumpet, come up here, this invitation, this marvelous invitation for him to come and see. And before the throne is this sea of glass like crystal. Now this is no decorative pond. Sometimes our imaginations are not big enough. But if we allow ourselves to uh, try to fight against the constraint of our imagination, just try to picture for a moment what this looks like. The throne, 
in all its glory, shimmering. The 24 thrones around it, in front of it, there's this, the fullness of the Spirit, and before that, there is this expansive sea that is like crystal. You know, this is what John sees after the tumultuousness of thinking through what's going to happen to these churches. The churches are being told about this persecution is that God is on his throne and he is the one who is all-powerful and in his throne room, he is above us. There were other scripture references, again, it's not on the slides, but there's other scripture references where it says in Ezekiel that, you know, the... the, the um, the, the, the sky looked like crystal. And here is before God the sea of crystal, and he's seated above it. And the Apostle John, he's living through this very tumultuous time. He himself was persecuted against for his beliefs. That's how he found himself on this isolated island of Patmos in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. And so he's given these visions that he is now encouraging the church with. He's saying, look, I know the things that you're going through. And God is telling me that more of that is to come, that it's not going to get easier. In fact, it's going to get harder. But I want to tell you about this vision that I've had of who God is. And let's refocus not on our circumstances at hand, which are hard but let's refocus on the god who sits on his throne and let's remember and tell ourselves again that god is the one who is mighty and we're reminded of that in the following verses that around the throne not only was not only were there, there are these 24 elders the fullness of the spirit the sea but there are also these four terrifying beasts of magnificence where each of them had the form of a different beast. There's one like a lion. There's one like an eagle. There's one that looks like an ox, and there's one that looks like a man, and each of them has these wings, and they're flying. Six wings, and they have eyes all around them, which means that they don't miss anything. They see all things, and they're standing before the throne of God. It echoes what Isaiah saw in chapter 6, verse 2 of his prophecy and what Ezekiel saw as well, that Isaiah was privy to this vision of these amazing angelic creatures and Ezekiel was as well. And here are these uh, echoes from the imagery there. In Isaiah, two wings covering their face, two wings covering their feet because God is holy. Two wings, they're flying and they're calling out just as these angels are calling out as well. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. Ezekiel 1.10 says the same thing, that here are these magnificent creatures with these amazing faces, these amazing heads. And as, again, Ezekiel is reaching for words to try to explain what he's seeing here. And these creatures, what they do, they do not cease in praising God, in echoing what Isaiah also heard in his vision, in his prophecy, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and is and who is to come. And the threefold holy, again, points to the symbolism of the number three, which is a complete number. Completely holy is the one who sits on the throne. There is no lacking in him. He's completely holy. And for the church entering into more persecution as they're already suffering, and John is telling them, here is what these angelic beings are also doing, that God, the one who sits on the throne, is even more worthy than these amazing creatures. That these amazing creatures are amazing in their own right, but they bow down to the one who's on the throne. And they call out and they say, that God is completely holy, and not only that, but they also bring to attention and remind us that God is the Almighty One. He is the one with all strength, with all power, not to bully people, but He is the one who is in control of all things. Of all things. And what happens next points to God as Creator. 
because here is the response of the elders. And every time that these angelic creatures call out to God, and every time that they worship God, the response of these elders is this natural response of praise where they take off their crowns and they throw it before God and they say to him, glory, honor, and thanks be to you who sits on the throne. God is radiant in his glory. He's worthy of all our respect, all our honor. He's worthy of the greatest depths of our gratitude, even in the midst of all this hardship. These creatures understand that and they give up this worship to God. And the worship that we do here on earth is, is but a foretaste of the worship that we get to participate in in heaven. And they fall down before God and they say, the reason that we worship is because you are the one who has created all things. For you have created all things because your will they existed and were created. These things are not by accident. You and I are here not by accident, but we are here, here under the specific will of God. He knows you and he knows me and he loves us. This is the reason for their worship. This is the reason that they respond in the same way where they also bow down before God who is worthy. God, you are in control of all things. You're worthy of all our praises. You are the one who's created all things out of your goodness, out of your creative power, out of your reason to just love and to uh, pour your love out on your creation. You are worthy of all things. What this is revealing to us is this focus in John's vision. This is the focus. We can see it right here that the God who is mighty, the one who is seated on his throne, who is in control, the creator of all things, is worthy of our praise. God's got us. God's in control. During this pandemic, during this unique moment in history, God's got us. God is in control. You know, we need to take this in mind. That are we living with this in mind, this, this understanding that you and I, that we don't have to be here, but we're here out of God's design, God's will, out of God's love. We also, what I also want to point us to is that, again, the persecuted church of God's time in his grace, God offered this vision for his, God offered this vision for his people. Know that God is seated. Know that God is all-powerful. Know that God is in control. Now, during this time, I think, uh, as I've also uh, We've talked about this a little bit before, but I think we also need to have a healthy theology of suffering. That God didn't promise to just give us happiness and to smooth out our lives before us. But this is what it means to imitate Jesus Christ. That Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote about this in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, and we have a quote here of what it means to imitate Jesus Christ in our lives, and that includes suffering with him that the Christian life is a life of crucifixion. When Christians are exposed to public insult, when they suffer and die for his sake, Christ takes on visible form in his church. And here we see the divine image created anew through the power of Christ crucified. You know, when we suffer, not because uh, when we suffer, not because we deserve it, not because we've looked for it, but when we suffer from persecution, you know, we are actually mirroring more the image of Jesus Christ in our lives. It's important that we know that. But it's also important that we can look forward with hope and with anticipation. Because this is what John's point was, to point the believer, to point to the beleaguered believer, 
to the beleaguered follower of Jesus Christ that God is on his throne and that we can look forward with hope and with anticipation. This is the overall message of Revelation is that here is the one who sees all things, who knows all things, who is all-powerful, and he is going to bring his good and holy and righteous judgment on the earth. And what followers of Christ need to do is to hold on and persevere in the power of the Spirit, in the face of even persecution, in the face of this pandemic, and we can do this with the hope of God's holy, holiness and righteousness. Do we know ourselves rightly? Because I think this also points to, do we really know our identities in Christ? J.I. Packer, he just passed away. He was a great Puritan writer and a great theologian, and he wrote this book, Knowing God, which I highly recommend. And he wrote in the book that there are certain things that we believe as believers, that we as believers need to have as part of our DNA. This is our identity and it needs to work itself out in every part of our lives. I remember the first time I read this quote. Now, I only took a portion of it here on, on the screen here, but I'll just read it, the more full quote here. It's, it's this, is that, do I, as a Christian, understand myself? Do I know my own real identity, my own real destiny? I am a child of God. God is my Father. Heaven is my home. Every day is one day nearer. My Savior is my brother, and every Christian is my brother too. And Packer continues, and he says, Say it over and over to yourself, first thing in the morning, last thing at night, as you wait for the bus, any time your mind is free, and ask that you may be enabled to live as one who knows it, uh, who knows it is all utterly and completely true. This is part of our identity, that we know that God is the one who sits on the throne, that every day that passes is one day closer, that Christ is my brother, not only is my Lord and Savior, but he is also my brother. We stay hopeful. We stay faithful. We rely on the Spirit because God's got us. God is in control. He's worthy of our praise. This doesn't mean that we put him to the test and go ahead and do whatever we want because we are wanting to twist the Lord's arm and do what we want, but it is a call to live with hope in the face of this historic moment that we're in. God's got us. It's like this. A friend of mine is a car enthusiast. He took me once for a ride in his peppy little sports car. It's called a Caterham Super 7, which is based on the Lotus 7. And it looks like this on the slide here. This is his actual car, actually. Uh, he took me for a ride, and we wheeled the car out of his garage, and the top was off, just like it is in the picture. And I remember uh, he opened the door, and it's this flimsy-looking door. And I thought to myself, I don't know what I'm getting myself into, but I trust my friend. And so I squeezed myself into the bucket seat, and it's not made for comfort, and it's just very, very pared down. It's very lightweight. It's made bare bones, but it's made for speed. It's made to respond to the whim of the driver. And I, as a passenger, just had to buckle up and know that my friend's got this. I know that he has it. So it's very minimal. It's 546 kilograms, so around 1,200 pounds. The engine can produce 200 horsepower, which means that this car can go from 0 to 60 in 3.7 seconds because the car is so light. Now compare that to the car that I drive, a Subaru Outback, which is about 1,700 kilograms, 30, 30, 3,740 pounds, so almost three times the weight, and at only 170 horsepower. So triple the weight, less horsepower. Now he took me out for a drive. And we're going, and he opened it up a little bit on a, straight, on a, on a straightaway. And again, my, my heart just leapt into my throat. And I thought, okay, calm down, because you know he knows what he's doing. He's got this. And I remember just thinking, like, you know, telling myself that. He's got this. He knows what he's doing. And we were going, and he was driving, and, you know, we had people looking at us, and we had one gentleman in a caravan in a family car, and he gives a honk, and he gives a thumbs up. He's like, oh, my gosh, that car's amazing. 
And we're driving, and all of a sudden, we're approaching an advanced green light, and we're a little bit of distance off. And my friend, he sees the light turn from green to yellow, and he, he automatically just puts it into gear, and we just start racing for it. It's in a safe way. And he makes this advanced green. He puts a little oomph into it to make the light. And again, like, we're taking this corner, and I'm only, you know, seated in that car, I said to him afterwards, it's almost like it's the closest thing that will feel like a motorcycle, but in a car form. I mean, you really feel the road. My, my, where I was seated was only like maybe a foot off the ground, and we're just flying. And when he takes this corner to make this light, and here's the thing, afterwards he asked me, hey, Alvin, were you scared? And I said, yeah, yeah, I was. <laughs> yeah, to, to be honest, Yes. But then I said to him, but here's the thing, is that I know you know what you're doing. I know that you're more than a capable driver who knows your car well. And to me, it's a new experience, but, and I don't know what the car is capable, capable of, but I know that he's taken it out on a closed track, and he's opened it up, and he's tested it to its limits to know what it's like. I was excited. My heart was beating faster. It was in my throat, but I trusted the driver. That he's in control, that he knows how much to do. Now look, I know things break down in illustration. And let's just say that my friend was also the one who put this car together piece by piece. Let's also say my friend was also the mechanic who worked and tuned the engine just so. Let's say he manufactured the tires and he knew the tires intimately, right down to the molecular level, to know its point of failure. And this is what God is like. That we might be fearful and we might honestly say to God, God, I am scared. I'm anxious. I'm stressed. But we remind ourselves over and over again, I'm a child of God. Heaven is my home. Each day brings me one day closer. My Savior is my brother. All Christians are my brothers and sisters. And God's got this. He is seated on his throne. He is in control. He can take all the brokenness, all the things of this world, and he is doing something in it and through it. I don't know what it is. I'm not sure what it is but we can trust that he is in complete control. We need to hear these words, whether pandemic or persecution, we need to take it to heart. May it sink down and transform us. God, our creator, God, the almighty one, is seated on his throne. He is not missing in action. He is right there. And during this time, know that God has me and you. He has our church. He has this world in his hands. And I'm not promising a happy fairy tale ending that we might want to envision, but know that God is at work through it all. The gospel is that Jesus experienced what we are going through. He suffered isolation on the cross, he was alone and in pain. He suffered the pain of death. But what the resurrection points to is that all things are being made right in and through Jesus Christ. God is worthy of our praise. He knows how this is all going to end, and it will end. And he's got us. God's in control. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray together. God, we want to thank you that through your word, you, you allow us glimpses of who you are. You reveal to, our, to us who you are. You have revealed to us through Jesus Christ who you are, that you are the one who loves us and has sacrificed everything so that we might be with you. And in this time we are, we're stressed, we're discombobulated, we're hurting, we're lonely, but we trust that you are in control right now, Lord. God, you are the powerful one. You are our creator. You are the one who loves us deeply. 
You are the one who knit us together. You know us intimately, better than we even know ourselves. You love us and you have us in your hands. And your grip on us is so tight, so strong, so secure. Father, may we know it deep in our hearts. And may we respond with faith through our anxiety, through our worry. May we respond with faith, turning to you in prayer and thanksgiving and experiencing a peace that surpasses understanding. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.